We come now to Psalm 19, which is one of the most beautiful and um, dramatic, if I could say, poetic psalms in the entire collection of the psalms. It talks about the glory of the heavens, the glory of God's word, and the glory of God directly. Now, there's a title to Psalm 19. If you look in the Hebrew text of Psalm 19, it tells you that the Hebrew title there, and again, we remind ourselves that these are in the Hebrew text. It says, To the chief musician, a psalm of David. Therefore, it was written by David, the son of Jesse, the great king of Israel, uh, the great prototype of the Messiah of Israel. And he wrote it to the chief musician which is either a reference to some of the choir leaders or music leaders, or we might even call them worship leaders in the uh, ancient Jewish tabernacle and temple system of that time among the Levites. Or it may be a reference to God himself, because God himself is the greatest musician, the chief musician. I, I like, in thinking about this psalm, to read the statement that C.S. Lewis made in a book he wrote about the Psalms, Reflections on the Psalms, is this book by C.S. Lewis. In there, this is what he says about Psalm 19. He says, I take this to be the greatest poem in the Psalter and one of the greatest lyrics in the world. Well, that was by a great man of literature and letters, C.S. Lewis. He called this one of the greatest poems or lyrics in the world. Psalm 19, let's take a look at it together, starting here at verse 1, and we're going to continue to the first line of verse 4. Here we go. Uh, Psalm 19, verse 1. The heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament show his handiwork. Day unto day utters speech, and night unto night reveals knowledge. There is no speech nor language where their voice is not heard. Their line has gone out throughout all the earth and their words to the end of the world. You have to love this beginning to the psalm, don't you? Here we have David looking up to the heavens. Now, it's not talking about the spiritual heavens where God is enthroned. But he's talking about the heavens of the blue sky and the heavens of the night sky. And he says, I see the glory of God declared in the heavens. David could look up and see it in the blue sky. You have the glory of the sun and the clouds and the beauty of sunrises and sunsets. Listen, you can't look at those things again and again and see this majestic beauty that God paints in the sky and not see the glory of God. And then David could see it also in the night sky. He could see the brightness of the moon, the awe of the starry sky. He could see the cloudy spread of distant galaxies. And those things together with their size, their awe, their grandeur, it shouts to David. It shouts to everybody who wants to see the God who created all of this is glorious. And this is evidence of his glory. You can look up at the, the, the blue sky or the night sky. And you can see that God is glorious in his size. I mean, after all, he created something so big. You can see that God is glorious in his engineering. He created something that works together so well. You know, it seems to me like I look up at the sky a lot and I never see the planets crashing into one another. That God is glorious in his artistry. He created something so beautiful. And God is glorious in his goodness and his kindness. He created something so useful and so beautiful for all humanity to see. So the heavens declare, verse 1, the glory of God. And verse 1, the firmament shows his handiwork. Now, David's just repeating the idea from the first line. Again, we remind ourselves that a characteristic of Hebrew poetry is repetition, showing emphasis through repetition. And firmament is just a poetic way of referring to the heavens of the sky, and they as well show the handiwork of God. Continuing on, verse 2, David says, Day unto day utters speech, and night unto night reveals knowledge. The day sky and the night sky speak to us. They reveal to us something about the glory of God, the wisdom of God, and the creative greatness of God. It's fascinating, verse 2, he uses this phrase, utters speech. Now, friends, I'm not a Hebrew scholar. But, but James Montgomery Boyce, who knows a lot more about the Hebrew than I do, this 
commentator who passed on to be with Jesus several years ago, he says about that phrase, utter speech, quote, this is stronger in the Hebrew text than it appears in the English. For the image is literally of a gushing spring that copiously pours forth sweet, refreshing waters of revelation. In other words, utter speech is just like it's pumping out speech and beautiful speech. And, and then it says it reveals knowledge. Think about it. If God had not placed the stars in the night sky, the blackness of night would have communicated very powerfully to all of humanity, both in the ancient world and the modern world. There's nothing out there. There's no one out there. But instinctively, when we look up at the glory of the night sky and see the, 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 what seems to be millions of stars, listen, it just speaks to us. There's something out there. And there it is. It speaks to us. Look at the phrasing there in verse 2. Day unto day utters speech, and night unto night reveals knowledge. I like what Charles Spurgeon said about that. He said, day tells us to labor. Night reminds us to prepare for our last home. Day tells us to work for God, and night tells us to rest in Him. Day tells us to look for an endless day, and night warns us to escape from the everlasting night. Yes, day unto day speaks to us, night unto night utters knowledge. And it goes out throughout all the world. Notice this, verse 3, there is no speech nor language where their voice is not heard. The glory of God in the visible heavens is for everybody to see. It's communicated to all mankind, no matter what their language is. It's a message that has, as it says in verse 4, gone out through all the earth. Now, in Romans chapter 1, written some thousand years after David wrote this psalm, in Romans chapter 1, Paul the apostle expanded on this idea. He explained that God's invisible attributes are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. That's in Romans chapter 1, verse 20. You see, what the Apostle Paul told us was that because this testimony has gone out throughout all creation, all men, and women, of course, for that case, all men, all humanity is without excuse for rejecting the God who gave us such a clear and such a beautiful evidence of his power and wisdom. I want to read you a quote by an astronomer, a physicist named Robert Jastrow. He said this, For the scientist who has lived by his faith in the power of reason, the story ends like a bad dream. He has climbed the mountains of ignorance. He's about to conquer the highest peak. And as he pulls himself over the rock, he is greeted by a band of theologians who have been sitting there for centuries. I like that image, don't you? About, yes, the, the astronomers, the physicists, they're doing their work. We thank God for their work. Discover the best you can. But when you come to the end of it all, you're going to discover the glory of God. Because I'll tell you something we know. Verse 1, the heavens declare the glory of God and the firmament shows his handiwork. And that voice has gone out throughout all the earth. And their words to the end of the world. Now, let me begin in the, in the middle, I should say, of verse 4. We read this. In them, in other words, in the sky, in the heavens, in them he has set a tabernacle for the sun, which is like a bridegroom coming out of his chamber and rejoices like a strong man to run its race. Its rising is from one end of heaven and its circuit to the other end, and there is nothing hidden from its heat. So in the heavens, God has set what David poetically calls here in verse four, a tabernacle for the sun. It's as if the nighttime sky is a dwelling place, a tent, a tabernacle for the sun. The sun comes out of the tent every day to cross the heavens, and then he returns to his tabernacle, his tent at night. Again, the night sky being like the tabernacle for the sun. And then it says in verse 5, like a bridegroom coming out of its chamber and rejoices like a strong man to run its race. The, the sun makes its course through the sky with strength and joy. It's like a man in his prime or an athlete running a race. Now, 
I think there's something very significant here, and it's suggested to me from a comment by Derek Kidner, who has an excellent commentary on uh, the book of Psalms. We read this and we can think that David is speaking in the Psalms in the same terminology that we read sometimes in ancient mythology. You know, uh, the sun is like a bridegroom coming out of its chamber and the night sky is like a tent. And we think, oh, okay, this is like uh, where in some Eastern conceptions, uh, the world is actually a turtle founded upon other turtles or uh, Apollos, the God drives his chariot of the sun across the sky. Listen, that would be the wrong way to take it. Because even though there's some similarity when David's making a likeness of this, make no mistake, David understands and proclaims that this is all under the Lord, Yahweh, the covenant God of Israel. In other words, this is just God's handiwork, and David's just illustrating God's handiwork as he talks about the sun looking like a strong man coming out of his room to run across the sky. It's not the same as this mythology. It, it gives a glance to it, as Derek Kidner says, but it also repudiates it. The, the sun is something like a bridegroom or a runner, but it is nothing more than something that Yahweh, God, has created. And then he says in verse 6, it's rising, it's from one end of the heaven, there's nothing hidden from its heat. The sun covers the whole sky and its strength extends everywhere. The sun is a wonderful example of the glory of God declared in the heavens. Okay, so we've come through the first six verses of Psalm 19 and we're like, wow, yes, Lord, your glory is revealed in creation. The message of God from creation is amazing and we drink it in. Now, let me tell you something that begins in verse 7. Now David's going to consider the message of God that comes from the word of God. The first six verses, that's the message of God coming from creation, what God has made. Now comes the message of God from what God has spoken, beginning here in verse 7. The law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. The statutes of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The judgments of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. I don't know if you could tell. I love just reading verses 7, 8, and 9 of Psalm 19. It's so powerful speaking about the wonder and the glory of God's word. You see, in verse 7, David makes an abrupt shift. In the first six verses, he was praising the God who reveals himself in creation. Now he's praising the very same God for revealing himself in his word. It's as if David said this, creation tells us much about God, but his word tells us much, much more. Now, one reason the Word of God is a greater revelation than creation is that the Word of God tells us much more about God. Now, we can learn a lot about God by looking at creation, no doubt about it. But it, it almost pales in comparison to what we learn about God by looking at the Word of God. The Word of God reveals Him as the covenant God of love. And you know, that's even reflected in the structure of this psalm. Okay, check it out. In the first six verses of Psalm 19, God is referred to as El or Elohim. It's the most generic word for God in the Hebrew language. It's even more generic than the commonly used Elohim. So El, 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 just the generic word for God, the most generic word for God in the first six verses. Yet here at verse 7 of Psalm 19, God is referred to as Yahweh the Lord, the God of covenant love and faithfulness to his people. Catch that out in verse 7. The law of the Lord is perfect. So it's as if David says, God is revealed in creation in a glorious but general sense. In his word, he's revealed to us specifically with much more um, detail in the revelation. Again, I like what Spurgeon said about this. He said, quote, he is wisest who reads both the world book and the word book as the two volumes of the same work and feels concerning them, my father wrote them both. 
I love that quote from Spurgeon. God wrote a world book in creation. You can see outside his glory, but he also wrote a word book. That's his word, the Bible, the word of God that we can read and take in and understand. Now, David explains the wonder of God's word with seven glorious statements about the Word of God. Probably no mistake that there's seven of them. The the implication in that biblical number being just completeness, perfection. The glorious statements about the Word of God, seven in number, tell us how wonderful, how effective it is. And David uses a variety of expressions to refer to the Word of God. Check it out. He calls it here in Psalm 119. I'm taking a look starting now at verse 7. The law, the testimony, and then in verse 8, the statutes, the commandments, and then in verse 9, he calls it the fear and the judgments. It's best to see these as poetic terms describing God's written revelation in general. In other words, he's not referring to one specific type or category of God's revelation, such as only the laws given in the Mosaic law or something like that. He's referring to God's word revealed to us through uh, the apostles, the prophets, the Old Testament scribes that God gave to us to communicate his word. So check this out from beginning at verse seven. It says, the law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. The word of God is perfect. It gives us all things that pertain to life and godliness. That's in 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 3. Now, let's admit, the Bible does not give us all knowledge, but all the knowledge it does give us is true and perfect. When we understand this in its literary context, God's word is never wrong. Now, I understand, the Bible is not fundamentally a science textbook, but whenever the Bible does speak about something that touches science, it's true. It's perfect. The the Bible is true in its history. The Bible is true in its understanding of divine nature and human nature. Now, part of the perfection of God's word is that it is effective. It does the work of converting the soul, as it says there in verse 7. There is power in the reading and hearing and studying of the Word of God. And that's power that goes beyond intellectual benefit. It actually changes the soul for the better. It actually converts the soul. Now, I've read that the Hebrew word that's translated converting the soul there in verse 7, the idea of converting is probably better understood as reviving. It brings new life to the soul. Then verse 7, The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. The word of God is sure. It's reliable. It's certain. As the psalmist would write later on at Psalm 119, verse 89. I love this one. Forever, O Lord, your word is settled in heaven. Now, that's a sure word, isn't it? Forever, O Lord, your word is settled in heaven. That's Psalm 119, verse 89. And because the word of God is so sure, it's so certain, it does the work of making wise the simple. Now, many people of simple education or upbringing have tremendous wisdom in life. They have tremendous wisdom in godliness. Why? Because they study the sure and certain word of God. But maybe they don't have much of a formal education in the institutions of this world, but there is example after example of plain, simple people who know the word of God and therefore they are wise. Verse 8 says, The statutes of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. God's word and the commands contained within them are right. They're morally right, they're practically right. They're universally right. They are right because it is the revelation of a God who's holy, a God who's true, and a God who is always right. Now, the one who knows the word of God and the one who knows the God of the word rejoices in this. They find joy. They find actual pleasure in the truth of God. They find actual pleasure in the relationship that they have with God as he's revealed in his word. Continuing on now, verse 8. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. Because God's word comes from a God who himself is pure and holy, 
it itself is pure. Listen, a pure God can communicate in no other way. We never have to worry about the word of God leading people into sin or into impurity. And it seems that if this has happened, it's evidence that the scriptures have been twisted, as 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 16 tells us the scriptures can be twisted by the wicked, the ungodly. But the pure word of God will enlighten the eyes. Did you see that in verse 8? The command of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. It will bring cheer and comfort and knowledge and confidence the, the same way that a light in the middle of darkness brings those things. Verse 9, the fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The word of God is clean, and therefore it's enduring forever. It'll never, ever fade or corrode. It'll never diminish because it has some impurity in it. It is clean, and it makes clean. Now, I want you to notice something here. As happens in Psalm 119, David calls, we're talking about verse 8, that line that says that the fear of the Lord is clear. Actually, verse 9, the fear of the Lord is clean. David refers to the word of God as the fear of the Lord. Why? Because God's word is deeply connected to the awe and majesty of God himself. The one who reads and hears and studies the word of God, the one who meets him in his word, will have an appropriate appreciation of God's awe and majesty. They will have the fear of the Lord. Now, continuing on, verse 9. The judgments of the Lord are true and righteous all together. David summarized this beautiful chain of seven pearls, each describing some aspect of the word of God. And he declared that the words of God are true and righteous altogether, that there's nothing false, there's nothing unrighteous in his word. Now, it's a little bit different when we get to verse 9, because all the preceding statements have had a very parallel structure. The law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise is simple. In each one of the preceding statements, David declares a quality of God's word and then something that it does. It uh, converts the soul. It makes wise the simple. It rejoices heart, on and on. When we get to the last statement, the summary statement, the judgments of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. I think it's interesting that there's no applied aspect to this statement as in the previous six. You know, for David, it was enough for him to simply say true and righteous altogether. You know, perhaps David assumed that we would be wise and logical enough to apply it to ourselves. Hey, because the word of God is all of these things, read it, study it, meditate on it, love it, live it. Now, before we move on to verse 10, verse 10 is wonderful, but before we move on there, I want you to remember something. Starting in verse 7, the law of the Lord is perfect. The statutes of the Lord are right. The testimony of the Lord is sure. The fear of the Lord is clean. All these things. I want you to remember, King David wrote this with only a fraction of what we have today as the word of God. And by most accounts, the portion that David had of the word of God was not as glorious as the complete revelation of God. David would have had the first five books of Moses. That's Genesis through Deuteronomy. He probably would have had Joshua and Judges. He would have had a few Psalms because a few Psalms were written in the time of Moses and such. Perhaps David would have had Job. Perhaps he would have had the book of Ruth. Can you imagine what King David would write about Isaiah or Hosea? or the entire book of Psalms, much less what David would write about any of the books of the New Testament. D David says all these things about the law of the Lord, and he didn't even read the Gospel of John. I hope you, I'm kind of excited about this, but this is a thrilling concept to me. David could not say enough about how wonderful, how helpful, how pure, how great, how, how useful, just how, how amazing the Word of God was, and we have God's word in completion, far more glorious than King David ever knew. <laughs> if David could say these things without having ever read the Gospel of John or, of course, any of the New Testament, 
Well, then what can we say about the Word of God? There are almost not words suitable to describe it. All right, moving on to verse 10. Again, speaking about the value of God's Word, more to be desired are they than gold, yea, than much fine gold, sweeter also than the honey and the honeycomb. Moreover, by them your servant is warned, and in keeping them there is great reward. K- King David insisted that the value of God's word, his written revelation to man, was more valuable and more desirable than gold itself. That David wanted no amount of money or wealth to command his attention and affection more than the word of God. David would actually rather read God's word than look at a big bank balance in his bank account. Now, let me tell you something. King David, uh, we're not talking about shepherd boy David. We're not talking about uh, fugitive David. We're, We're not talking about, you know, early David. We're talking about King David. King David was a massively wealthy man. Unbelievable. David was so wealthy that the great temple that Solomon built, David funded the building of that temple before he died. That's how wealthy David was. Yet isn't it fascinating that we rarely think about David for his wealth. We think about Solomon for his wealth. We think sometimes about Abraham for his wealth. We rarely think about David for his wealth. Why? Because David is rightly much more known for his great heart towards God. Now, Solomon, it's true, was even more wealthy than his father David. And Solomon was known for his riches, yet he was not nearly as known as much for his heart towards God and his love of God's word. Now, if it wasn't enough for David to say that God's word should be more desirable to us than gold, then David amplifies the point. Did you see the amplification? It's in verse 10. He says, yea, then much fine gold. I mean, look, gold is gold, but fine gold is better than regular gold, I guess. And so what an amazing thing. But by most everybody who walks this earth, they would rather have gold than God. They'd rather have riches than the word of God. But listen, that's not the way things work in time and eternity. God, God knows what's truly precious. And, and I'm not against gold. <laughs> I, I, look, I'll just speak honestly. I'd rather have money than not have it. But yet I know this, that what God gives us in his revelation, I'm not talking about the ink on the page. I'm talking about the living, active word of God and how God meets us in his word and how he works with power in and through his word. That is something that money can't buy and is even greater than gold. Not only that, verse 10, sweeter also than the honey and the honeycomb. For King David, God's word was not only to be held in greater esteem than material wealth, but also greater, check it out, I'm going to use my words carefully here, God's word was also greater than sensual experiences. Honey is sweet and pleasant to eat. It pleases the senses. Listen, you eat some good honey and you go, Wow, that is sweet. Wow, that tastes good. It's so pleasant to eat. But let me tell you something. God's word is sweeter still. God's word will bring you greater satisfaction in life than experiences you can have through your senses. Verse 11. Moreover, it's as if he's saying in addition to all that, moreover, by them, by your word, Your servant is warned, and in keeping them there is great reward. Here David gave two reasons why the word of God was greater than gold, material wealth, or the pleasures that we come to in our senses, what we can eat or see or feel. This is why the word of God is greater. Number one, God's word gives us instruction. In verse 11, he calls it warning. God's word gives us instruction that the wealth or pleasures of this world do not give us. We need warning. We need warning for the sins that we're susceptible to. We need warning for the dangers that we cannot see. We we need warning for the dangers we can't appreciate. Maybe we see them, but we don't appreciate them. 
We need warning for the dangers that are far off in our future. And warnings from God are often rejected. So God's word gives instruction, but it also gives benefit, reward. And it's reward greater than wealth or pleasures. Did you notice that phrase in verse 11? Great reward. In keeping them, there is great reward. Now, it is also true that there is great reward for keeping the word of God. But that's not what the psalmist says here in verse 11. Here, David notes the reward in keeping them. Check it out. There is a sense in which obedience to God becomes its own reward because we live in the way that God wants us to live and designed us to live. You know, one of the great rewards of keeping the word of God, or maybe I should say this, one of the great rewards in keeping the word of God is peace of mind. Uh, Let me read you a quote here, this beautiful quote from uh, Charles Spurgeon. He says this, A quiet conscience is a little heaven. A martyr was fastened to the stake, and the sheriff who was about to execute him expressed his sorrow that he should persevere in his opinions and compel him to set fire to the pile. The martyr answered, Do not trouble yourself, for I am not troubling myself. Come and lay your hand upon my heart and see if it does not beat quietly. His request was complied with, and he was found to be quite calm. Now, said he, Lay your hand on your own heart and see if you are not more troubled than I, and then go your way, and instead of pitying me, pity yourself. (laughs) I read that quote from Charles Spurgeon's great treasury of David, his great commentary on uh, the book of Psalms. What an illustration. He's talking about a man at the stake going to be burned to death in martyrdom. And the man who's supervising the execution, the law enforcement official, the sheriff, He feels terrible about this. He's just doing what he has to do, supposedly. And the man who's about to burn at the stake says, put your hand on my heart and see how calm I am. And then he says to the the law enforcement official, the sheriff, he says, put your hand on your own heart and see how it's beating like a drum. He says, worry about your own soul. This peace that God gives us is one of the great rewards in keeping his word. Now, Verses 12 and 13. Who can understand his errors? Cleanse me from secret faults. Keep it back your servant also from presumptuous sins. Let them not have dominion over me. Then I shall be blameless and I shall be innocent of great transgression. Now in verse 12, David says, Who can understand his errors? In the previous verse, David reflected on the warnings that we find on the word of God and in the great reward that we find in obeying God's word. This made him reflect on the times and the ways that he had ignored the warnings and that he had not kept the word. That's why he says, who can understand his errors? That's in verse 12. David understood that he had, at least at times, ignored and disobeyed God's word. In that there were times even more that he could understand and be aware of. What David knew was enough to make him concerned, but his actual errors before God were still worse. Now, notably, the fact that we cannot understand our errors does not excuse us from the errors. We are still accountable before God for such errors and faults, and we must trust in his atonement to cleanse us from those errors and secret faults. That's why David says in verse 12, cleanse me from secret faults knowing that David could not know just how many his errors were before God, King David very wisely prayed this prayer. He needed cleansing even from the sins and faults that were secret to him. I like what Adam Clark said about secret faults. Here he kind of sought to define what secret faults were. Ready? Quote Adam Clark. From those which I have committed and have forgotten, from those which I have not repented, from those which have been committed in my heart, but have not been brought to act in my life, from those which I have committed without knowing that they were sins, sins of ignorance, and from those which I have committed in private, for which I should blush blush and be confounded, were they ever to be made public. Oh yeah, we, we deal with secret faults, do we not? And we can ask God to cleanse us from those things. But not only that, look at verse 13. 
He says, keep back your servant from presumptuous sins. David added this because he knew that his problem was greater than secret faults and unknown errors. Yes, those were problems. Secret faults, a problem. Unknown errors, a problem. But without God's help, and here he's praying for God's help, without God's help, David was also perfectly capable of committing presumptuous sins, sins that are done in a proud and knowing way. Brothers and sisters, there are certain things that make our sin presumptuous, make our sin even more sinful before God. When we sin when we know better, that's presumptuous. When we sin when our friends have warned us, that's presumptuous. When we sin when God himself has warned us, that's presumptuous. When we sin because we've warned others against the same sins, that's presumptuous. When we plan and relish our sin, that is presumptuous sins. And the prayer, Lord, keep me from my presumptuous sins. That's a great prayer to pray. I want you to see something else here in verses 12 and 13. We have a description of errors and secret faults, and presumptuous sins. That reminds us that sin has a progression. Think about this. Sin goes from a passing temptation to a chosen thought. You could call those errors. Then it goes from a chosen thought to an object of meditation, something I really choose to think about again and again. Then it goes from an object of meditation to wished for fulfillment. I stop thinking about it and start wishing for it. Then it goes from wish-filled fulfillment to a planned action. I think you could call that secret faults. Then it goes from a planned action to an opportunity sought. Then it goes from an opportunity sought to a performed act. Then it goes from an action to a repeated action. Then it goes from a repeated action to a delight. You could call that presumptuous sins. Then it goes from delight to new and various ways to commit the sin. Then it goes from new and various ways to commit the sin to a habit. Then it goes from a habit to idolatry. It's demanding to be served. And then it goes from idolatry to sacrifice. And then it goes from sacrifice to slavery to that sin. Do you see the long and terrible progression of sin? And all along this continuum, every step along this terrible path, the Holy Spirit, and hopefully our conscience as well, but the Holy Spirit at least, cries out to us, no, stop. All along this continuum, we are given, I love what it's called in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 13, we're given the way of escape, if we will only take it. Yet, if we do not take it, and if we end up in slavery to sin, it legitimately questions the state of our soul. Now, because of this great danger, that's why David prayed a prayer. I think we should all pray, Lord, keep back your servant also from presumptuous sins. Verse 13, do not let them have dominion over me. David not only knew that he was capable of such sins, but that they could potentially have dominion over him. His prayer was rightly placed. His love of God's word and his dependence upon God in prayer would help him stay free from the dominion of enslaving sin. Now, obviously, I think it was fitting for David to pray this prayer, but I'm going to tell you that this prayer is even more fitting for the one who relates to God on the basis of the new covenant. Check out what Paul wrote in Romans chapter 6, verse 14. The Apostle Paul wrote this. For sin shall not have dominion over you, for you are not under law but under grace. Brother, sister, you have every promise in Jesus Christ greater for you to pray this prayer with confidence. Let them not have dominion over me. Lord, you've made provision in the cross, in the perfect work of Jesus Christ, that sin should not have dominion over me. Lord, make this real, make this active in my life. When that's true, then it says in verse 13, then I shall be blameless. David knew that if sin was addressed in his life, dealing with the inward secret sin and the outward presumptuous enslaving sin, then David could be blameless and innocent of great transgression. Now, please understand, this was not a claim of sinless perfection. 
David not claim to have achieved sinless perfection, to have attained it any time before the resurrection. David knew well that he needed to be cleansed, and he trusted in God's perfect sacrifice, those sacrifices that were prefigured by the animal sacrifice that David practiced in the Mosaic system, bringing those animals or sacrifice before the priests of Israel. David understood blamelessness and innocence on a human, relative level and not in an absolute sense, according to the divine measure. Well, we conclude this psalm with verse 14. This this is an amazing, amazing conclusion to the psalm. Look at verse 14. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, my strength and my Redeemer. King David closed this glorious psalm with a humble surrender of his mouth and his heart to God. David knew that real godliness was not only a matter of what a man did, but also a matter of what he said, of what he thought in his heart. In other words, David says, let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight. It's not the proud proclamation that he knows he's innocent and blameless. This was a prayer. This was a plea to be made pure before God by God's transforming power. And so with the last line of the psalm, he says, O Lord, my strength and my redeemer. David looked up to the Lord God to be his strength and redemption. He knew that he needed a redeemer and that the faithful God would rescue him. Now, strength there in the last line of the psalm O Lord, my strength and my redeemer. Strength can also be translated as rock. God's strength is like a mighty rock, like a huge boulder that rescues us and gives us a firm standing place. And then when he says, my strength and my redeemer, redeemer is that great Hebrew word goel. It refers to the kinsman redeemer. You see, it was the redeemer, the goel, who bought his relative out of slavery. It was the Redeemer, the Goel, who rescued his relative out of bankruptcy and total loss. King David looked to God himself as his kinsman Redeemer. And in it, we see that this psalm, Psalm 19, it runs a glorious course. It begins with recognizing the glory of God in creation, then the glory of God in his written revelation. Next to this great God and his great works, David then knew himself to be small and sinful, yet this great God would also be David's strength, his rock, his redeemer, his goel, as David put his trust in him. What what a message for us. There is enthroned in heaven a glorious God of creation and revelation. But that glorious God of creation and revelation is also the glorious God of personal relationship and redemption for his people. Brothers and sisters, King David knew that. So should we. So should we. God helping us, we will. Now let's conclude Psalm 19 with a thought that we often come to in our study through the Psalms. We ask ourselves a question, How does Psalm 19 point to Jesus? Well, let me give you three ways. I'm not saying these are the only three ways, but here are three ways that Psalm 19 points to Jesus. First of all, because Jesus created all things, by the way, you know that, don't you? That God the Son, the second person of the Trinity, Jesus Christ, he was the active agent of the Trinity in creation. Colossians chapter 1, verse 16 says this, For by him all things were created that are in heaven and that are on earth. Okay, because Jesus created all things, then it is his glory on display in the heavens and the earth. Isn't that thrilling? When you look up at the glory of God, you are looking at God's glory revealed, the revelation of Jesus Christ. Because It was him 
by his hand, so to speak, that all things were created. Now, I'm not trying to imply that God the Father and God the Holy Spirit had no role in creation. The triune God, the Godhead was active. But of course, Jesus created all things. We're told that specifically. So we see him revealed in the glory of creation. That's number one. Number two, because Jesus is the word, and can I read to you the gospel of John chapter one, verse one? In the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. Using that great Greek term logos to refer to God the son, to Jesus Christ. Because Jesus is the word, then the preciousness and the value of God's written word is a reflection of the preciousness and value of Jesus himself. How wonderful that is. Jesus is the creator of all things. Jesus is the word. We see that revealed in Psalm 19. But then finally, if you take a look at verse 14, Jesus is our strength and our redeemer. Oh, Lord Jesus, you are my strength, my rock. And by the way, the New Testament speaks in that terminology, specifically applying that idea of rock to Jesus Christ. But he's also our redeemer, our goel, our near kinsman who buys us up out of slavery, who rescues us from bankruptcy and avenges our honor. This is Jesus himself, our strength, that is our rock, and our Redeemer, that is our Goel. Praise the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, who is so beautifully revealed to us in Psalm 19. Let me pray for that. Lord, we receive the glorious revelation that you've given to us through creation. We receive the glorious revelation that you've given to us in your word. And Lord, we trust in Jesus Christ as our strength, our rock, and as our Redeemer, our Goel. Be that for us now, Lord, now and forevermore. We put our trust in you. In Jesus' name, amen.